Should I start sharing okay. my screen? We are live. Yes, go ahead. Um, yep, we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get this party started. Don't any of you have that guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game. We are Myth Vision. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic today is quite a sobering one, especially the thumbnail you look at. While I was editing this thumbnail, I, for a moment, was feeling like I was actually like autopsying a corpse. And it was, I mean, Derek Bennett was on the phone with me, and I was like, this is really weird. Like, we're looking at the body of Jesus, right? I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm, I'm editing this thumbnail. And I'm like, this is really in your face. And of course the artwork you're going to go into is part of the presentation something that came out of uh, Francesca Stavrakopoulou's book and uh, God and anatomy and anatomy. She also talks about an autopsy in there. It's one of the chapters. Um, let's go ahead and jump in here. Derek Bennett, welcome back to myth vision. How are you, brother? I'm well. I'm really happy to be here. I'm excited, nervous, mostly excited. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, this is a serious subject. I really want people to understand that we're not here clowning. This is not a joke. Uh, Christians that are in the chat, they're not joking. They really want you to believe, for the most part. There are some trolls out there, the Darth Dokken types and weird, uh, strange kind of people that are out there. But most Christians are very serious about their faith and serious about the belief that Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, so much so, they'll knock on your front door. They will go out of their way to try and engage ideologically and have you convinced that, and I'm speaking specifically about apologists or fundamentalists and people that are legit trying to change people's minds. And so I think it's only best that you state a defense, which is going to be your presentation today for why we don't believe. And that's, it's a fair defense. So first I got to plug away. You have a YouTube channel. If I can get a mod potentially to go through and copy and paste his link for his YouTube channel down in the uh, comment section, please go subscribe to Derek's channel, A Theologica. He will be coming back. We will have more of him. So please do tell us what your channel's about real briefly before we get started. Um, you know, uh, years and years ago, I started a blog called Atheologica, and the and the sub line was subjecting religion to critical thought. So that's exactly what my YouTube does. I'm subjecting religion to critical thought with a lot of input from the history of religions, comparative religion, and that kind of thing, since that's my forte. Awesome. Yeah. Every time you come on, I know it's going to be something good, a good presentation, which means my expectations are higher than you want them to be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> also the Patreon. I just dropped two awesome videos. Uh, one with my good friend, Karen De La Carriere, the craziest Scientologist, Captain Bill, uh, radically crazy. Uh, Jewish and Christian imitation from another person who was a student of Dennis McDonald. And of course, this is interpolations in the Quran. Like these things haven't been made public. There's Lots and lots of videos. Please consider joining us there. It helps keep us alive and going. And all the scholars I've come that come on to pay, I use these funds to help do that and pay these scholars and keep doing what I'm doing here at Myth Vision. Also, there's a course I was editing this morning before we get started. I have to mention this. Genesis course with Bart Ehrman. Go to mythvisionpodcast.com forward slash Genesis. I watched and helped participate in the editing process of this project. Bart goes deeper than I thought. Everything from the documentary hypothesis, he gets into anachronisms and doublets and why it's mythical and, and fictional and legendary and like not trustworthy, et cetera, from the whole Pentateuch, you know? So, but especially Genesis, it's really interesting stuff. I also am going to Israel in October. If you want to help participate in making that happen with the GoFundMe, I have this all, all of this is in the description. 
consider helping me go and sit in the judgment seat of Pontius Pilate, where he literally would have said guilty or innocent in his verdict. So also right here, Derek Bennett, tell us what's going on with this, my friend. So the Global Center for Religious Research is starting online courses that's beginning next month. And I'm encouraging everyone to sign up there. It's only $140 per course. Um, that's, you know, con compared to a, a college tuition or uh, anything like that, university level, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a definite value. So uh, you're gonna, we're going to have uh, Darren Slade, Dr. Darren Slade himself, teaching uh, a course on religious trauma. Raphael Latastor will be teaching a philosophy of religion course mm -hmm. uh, concerning the various arguments for and against the existence of God. And then Dr. Aaron Ricker will be teaching a course on Bible and culture, which even concerns uh, how how the Bible plays a role in our culture even today uh, in contemporary art, film, TV, you name it. So these are going to be some really great courses taught by actual experts. And I absolutely do encourage you guys to sign up. Awesome. You Thank will, in you fact, get a certification for doing so. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that plug. Real quick, uh, shout out to Scott Daniel. Love the title for this, D. I've taken... Uh, taken to saying Jesus is dead in response to apologists for a while now, and it's pretty cathartic. And then also, I really appreciate that, by the way, Scott. Jason Anderson with the Super Sticker, thank you so much. Save your Super Chats, your questions for the end of this presentation, as I will not be inter in interrupting Derek Bennett, because this is a serious presentation. We're going to be tackling apologetics on the resurrection of Jesus, and um, I will be happy to go through them. So if you send them throughout the presentation, that's fine. I will address them when we're done. And um, tell us, get us into this. What got you started and then the presentation? Let me start by saying it's something that you and I had talked about, something that you touched on briefly, that you know I'm not an evangelical atheist and that I'm not trying to dissuade Christians from their belief. I have no problem with people believing whatever they want, as long as they're not harming anyone. So this presentation is going to be pretty blunt, very frank and hard hitting. But uh, I want to stress that more than anything else, I, I'm not on offense. I'm on defense. I'm not trying to offend believers. I'm defending non-belief. I'm saying this is why we're not buying it. The apologetic arguments for the resurrection of Christ, they don't pass muster, and, and here's why. Um, and I myself am, am simply um, convinced that the resurrection of Jesus did not happen for reasons I'll be getting into. Um, so I did want to preface it with that. But I've been studying apologetics for years and years and years uh, since my late 20s, and I'm 44 now. So, you know, a good 15 years. Uh, I cut my teeth on James Patrick Holding's site, tectonics.org. So I've been into this stuff for a while, and I know these arguments like the back of my hand. So, uh, and, and, and of course, I keep up on all the YouTube videos from uh, big timers like Paula Gia and so forth. And, and I follow this stuff to the T. So that's what I'm going to be getting into today. And uh, unless you've got anything else, any more inputs? If you want to go ahead and uh, start sharing the screen, everybody in the chat, hold on to your britches and uh, get ready for the ride. I'm excited to see what is said today. Derek told me, he said, look, don't get too, don't have your expectations too high. I hope it's good. But uh, just to shout out those who showed up early, early, I think it might be from today because I had to set up a few days. Moon Shoes, you have a thousand myth money. See, Pine Points is Doug. I have myth money. And so you can cash it out when you go to heaven at the pearly gates. You can't, you can't take your earthly gold, none of that. But you got a thousand myth money. Kenzu, you have 500 myth money and 250 to Richard Williams. Thank you for showing up early. Joel Pearson, lots of people in the chat. Uh, really appreciate you all showing up. Seriously, appreciate the love. Hit that like button. Get ready for the apocalypse of apologetics. All right, Derek, here we go. I'm adding it to the screen, and you are there. It looks great. All right. 
Did Jesus rise from the dead? The failure of resurrection apologetics by yours truly. All right. So I just popped into the next screen. Are you following? I am. I'm muting just so I don't, there's okay. no audio issue. Okay. So we're going to begin with the principle of analogy. We can only assess the prior probability of a historical occurrence for which we were not present by way of comparison to analogous data. So this is just a fancier way of saying, what does it look like? We weren't there. We don't know. But you know, when we look at uh, data, <laughs> you know, uh, from 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 the present day all the way down through history, what does it most resemble? We have no real world analogy to fully deceased persons physically arising from death. None, none at least that we can verify. Our contemporary experience of the world, along with biological science, tells us that this is vastly improbable, if not impossible. The closest analogy we do have is of the mythic and legendary varieties, such as the bodily resurrections of other ancient divinities like Osiris, Baal, Inanna, as well as Aristeas and Asclepius. Uh, check out my past presentation, Resurrection and Apotheosis in Pre-Christian Antiquity, to get up to speed on, uh, on all of that information. Like Christ, the resurrections of these figures were accompanied variously by exaltation, enthronement, missing body, morti missing body motifs, and or post-mortem appearances to others. All were hence immortal, never to die again. By way of analogy, the death and resurrection of Christ has all the appearance of an ancient legend with no correspondence to real-world data. Per the old adage, if it acts like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Simple enough. Posterior probability. Christian apologists argue that a special case can be made for the resurrection of Christ based on overriding evidence. This is the posterior probability the likelihood of a historical occurrence, despite all appearances, despite prior probability, after the evidence has been taken into account. The nearly insurmountable issue for apologists is that for something as vastly improbable as the resurrection, which has no correspondence to real world events, the evidence would have to be extraordinarily compelling. This is why we say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. That said, let us examine the evidence. Is it sufficiently compelling enough to conclude that in this one instance, a sacred figure really was raised from the dead to a mortal life? So starting with persecution and martyrdom, apologists argue that the willingness of the disciples to undergo persecution and even death speaks to the truth of the resurrection. Unlike the 9-11 hijackers or Islamic suicide bombers, these individuals were in a position to know whether or not Christ had truly been raised. Their proximity to the events means that they must have yielded their lives for the sake of what they knew was true. After all, who would die for a lie? Objection number one, there is a major distinction to be made between lying and being sincerely mistaken. I agree that early Christians sincerely believed that Christ had been raised. I don't think anyone was lying, and I don't think most skeptics think that. Objection two. The earliest Christians believed that Christ had been exalted to heaven upon his resurrection rather than resuming his earthly life in contemporary Judea. See A.W. Zweep, The Ascension of the Messiah and Luke and Christology on this point. Also see my previous presentation, uh, Resurrection and Apotheosis in Pre-Christian Antiquity, where I do more of a deep dive into this as well. So they didn't have this idea that you find in the Gospels that Jesus is hanging out in Judea for a day, 40 days, however long. Uh, it was that he had been exalted up to heaven to be at the right hand of God. How could their faith in such a thing be proven false? How was anyone going to say, hey, you know this didn't happen. You know Jesus wasn't really around to speak with and eat fish with and all this. No, they believed he was up in heaven. How exactly were you going to falsify that? 
of course you could bring up the uh the empty tomb and 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 the exhuming of the body but we will certainly get to that objection number three fervent believers have in fact yielded their lives for demonstrably false beliefs even when they were in a position to know better marshall applewhite of the heaven's gate ufo cult not only took his own life believing his own self-deception about a spaceship trailing the comet haley bop but convinced 38 others to do the same more recently the january 6th capital writer ashley babbitt died fighting for the demonstrably false belief that the 2020 election was rigged against former president donald trump people die for sincerely held beliefs even when they could have known better had they just listened we have no prior we have no data prior to pliny the younger's letter to emperor trajan around 112 ce that early christians were actually made to recant their faith on pain of death the stoning of stephen in Acts 7 concerns a later convert not a disciple or a witness james son of zebedee is killed by herod in acts 12 but we're never told whether he had a chance to recant what the circumstances of his death were first clement around 95 ce if even that early vaguely says that peter and paul witnessed unto death though we are not told of the circumstances of their deaths whether they had a chance to recant or whether recanting would have been relevant Convincing arguments have been made that First Clement concerns the jealousy and envy of fellow Christians, an internal strife that disturbed the peace and led to uh, intervention from Roman authorities. See David L. Eastman's jealousy, internal strife, and the deaths of Peter and Paul, a reassessment of First Clement uh, in the Journal of Ancient Christianity, very convincingly argued. Who else is going to be jealous or envious but fellow Christians? So this would not have been a matter of the, the Roman authorities saying, hey, I need you to recant your belief. No, they would have said, hey, I need you to stop causing a ruckus or we're killing you. The closest thing we have from a secular historian is Josephus's account of the death of James, whereby the high priest Ananus, a bold man in his temper and very insolent, saw an opportunity to flex his political muscle by bringing James and some others before the Sanhedrin, forming an accusation against them as breakers of the law and having them stoned to death. Many were upset by this, resulting in King Agrippa stripping Ananus of the high priesthood. So breakers of the law, if you know anything about ancient Judaism, in terms of the Mosaic law, it was not a monolith. Different Jews had different interpretations of the law and how it should be practiced so this appears to be a matter of you're not practicing the law in the way that i would prefer as a sadducee which is what ananus was so he had him killed for that there's there's just nothing here explicitly speaking of the resurrection and then king agrippa strips ananus of the high priesthood for having done what he did how likely is that if james and company were preaching jesus as the risen messiah who would conquer rome and so forth Please, this is it's just not about that. There's nothing in the text that would uh, that would recommend that. Later second century accounts concerning the deaths of Peter, Paul, and John are so legendary and fictitious that they cannot be deemed reliable. They include stories of talking animals, resurrected fish, the resurrection of Paul, and John surviving being boiled alive. They're just fiction, and they're they can't be taken at their word. Fervent belief in the face of persecution is a common theme in other faith traditions. Samaya bint Kabat was a female companion of Muhammad, of Muhammad and an early martyr for Islam. The Quraysh persecuted Muslims of low social rank. Members of the Maksum clan tortured Samaya's family to pressure them to abandon their faith. On one occasion, she was put inside a pitcher full of water and lifted so that she could not escape. She, Yasser, and Amar were all forced to stand in the sun in the heat of the day dressed in male coats. Although described as a very old and frail woman, Sumaya remained steadfast and refused to abandon Islam. A member of the Maksum clan later killed her by stabbing and impaling her with his spear. Uh, you know, she would not ab abandon her faith even in the face of persecution and death. Doesn't speak to the truth of Islam. 
Anti-Mormonism was so severe that early Mormons were forced to flee west to Salt Lake Valley in Utah. In 1838, the Missouri governor declared the Mormons must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state. Shortly thereafter, a militia attacked a Mormon settlement at Hans Mill, which resulted in the death of 18 Mormons. The religion endured, it carried on, didn't matter. Threats of, of death and, and, and persecution, the religion perseveres nonetheless. An 1838 pamphlet titled Antidote to Mormonism described Mormons as miserable enemies of both God and man, engines of death and hell. My point being that Often you'll see apologists say, well, but they face, they face so much persecution. Well, even if they did, it doesn't speak to that. I mean, it, they, they certainly sincerely held these beliefs, but it doesn't have any bearing on whether or not those beliefs were true. Getting into the empty tomb, a tomb found empty. Critics point out that the empty tomb narrative is not definitively introduced until the Gospel of Mark, some 40 years after the death of Jesus, and the subsequent Gospel accounts are all dependent upon Mark. In answer to this, apologists cite 1 Corinthians 15, which contains an early creedal statement that Christ was buried. That's it, was buried. It cannot be known whether this entailed a tomb or a trench grave. If we follow uh, Dale Allison in granting that by burial, Paul meant an honorable burial. Let's just grant that. Let's say it was, it was indeed an honorable burial. Still, the majority of the Jewish non-elite population in early Roman Palestine was buried in trench or cyst graves. Unlike rock-cut rock cut tombs, trench graves did not impose an obvious mark on the ancient landscape or the archaeological record. It is for this reason that the simple trench graves at Qumran have been called Essene, sectarian, heterodox, and deviant, as have trench graves discovered elsewhere. These graves, however, likely represent the common burial practice of those near and below subsistence level, which we know Jesus probably was. That's per Anthony Ketty, the Vitae Profetarum, and the Archaeology of Jewish Burials, Exploring Class Distinctions in Early Roman Palestine in the Journal of Ancient Judaism. It is certainly possible that Jesus was buried in a tomb, but the mere possibility does not make it probable. To argue as such is a possibility or fallacy. If whoever drafted the creed did have in mind burial in a tomb, then logically that wouldn't tell their having thought that Jesus' body was no longer in the tomb since he'd been taken up to heaven. But that still doesn't equate to the gospel narratives whereby the tomb was actually found, discovered empty. So even if you wanted to argue that Paul had in mind a tomb and that the tomb had been left empty, that, that doesn't get you to the narratives we have in the gospels where the tomb is actually discovered empty. That's equivocation. Apologists argue that had the, resurrection, had the resurrected body of Jesus not actually left a tomb vacant, Jewish or Roman authorities would have produced his corpse in order to quell the movement. According to Acts 2, however, the apostles did not begin preaching the resurrection until seven weeks after his death at Pentecost, about 50 days later. By then, no recognizable corpse of Jesus could be produced. Within three weeks, within three weeks, you've got advanced decay. And by around the 50-day mark, at 50 plus days, you're into skeletonization. Uh, you know, if we take X by its word, and uh, you know, I don't, <laughs> but uh, it pretty well tracks. I mean, who was going to who who was going to take it upon themselves to actually uh, exhume the corpse to begin with? But if they had, it wouldn't have been until some time after they were preaching this. So, you know, I'd say Acts 2 pretty well tracks with uh, how much time would have elapsed by the time anyone would have been concerned with what these people were preaching. And, you know, at 50 days or over, there's just there's not going to be anything to produce that's going to be remotely identifiable as Jesus. Apologists appeal also to Jewish polemics concerning the empty tomb as verification of their knowledge that the tomb was actually found empty. According to Matthew 28 in Justin Martyr's dialogue with Trypho, Jews charged that the disciples had simply stolen the body. Assuming that such polemics are actually historical rather than fictitious, this cannot be taken as firsthand knowledge of an empty tomb by Jews in the late first or mid second century. 
Uh, if the precise location of Jesus' grave cannot be determined, and that may well be if it was in an unmarked cyst grave, or if the body of Jesus could not be identified by the time Christian preaching reached Jerusalem, which it could not have, there would have been no alternative for Jewish polemicists than to concede the possibility of the bare fact of the grave's emptiness and then go on to point out that in any event, the emptiness of the grave, even, it could, even if it could be demonstrated, would not prove anything more than that the body had been stolen or deliberately removed by the followers of Jesus themselves. So this does not prove that Jews conceded that they knew for a fact that there was an empty tomb. It's just a tit for tat. It's rhetoric. The empty tomb narrative represents a common motif in the Hellenistic world from which Christianity sprang. That is the apotheosis tales of other divine men that thickly foliated the region. Romulus, when he vanished, left neither the least part of his body nor any remnant of his clothes to be seen. The senators suffered them not to search or busy themselves about the matter, but commanded them to honor and worship Romulus as one taken up to the gods. And immediately lightning fell from the heavens and the pier was wholly consumed. After this, when the companions of Eolus came to gather up the bones of Heracles and found not a single bone anywhere, they assumed that in accordance with the words of the oracle, he had passed from among men into the company of the gods. Aristeus went into a fuller shop at Proconesus and there died. The owner shut his shop and went away to tell the dead man's relatives and the report of Aristeus' death being spread about in the city was disputed by a man of Kizikus, who said that he had met Aristeus going toward Kizikus and spoken with him. While he argued vehemently, the relatives of the dead man came to the fuller's shop with all that was necessary for burial, but when the place was open, there was no Aristeus there, dead or alive. There are many, many, many examples of this trope in the Hellenistic world. Uh, <laughs> well before, during, and after the time of Christianity. Probably not a coincidence. Dr. Richard Miller proposes that the final chapters of Mark, chapters 15 through 16, including the empty tomb narrative, place the tradition squarely within that of Romulus. He lists the following five mimetic signals. Those include the missing body, of course, uh, prodigies, signs, and wonders, darkness over the land, uh, being declared son of God and the people fleeing. Uh, that's from Mark's Empty Tomb and other translation fables in classical antiquity in the Journal of Biblical Literature. I highly recommend reading that work. Um, and he also does a comparison. Th this is just a small sampling. He does a comparison of the Romulus tale and you know the, the motifs and tropes associated with it with all three of the Synoptic Gospels and the, the, the sheer preponderance of parallels is just overwhelming. Um, I tend to think that early Christians, the gospel writers, were probably quite familiar with these apotheosis traditions, thus it's no surprise to find a missing body motif in these gospels. Too early for myth. Apologists argue that there simply had not been enough time for mythic and legendary embellishment in the interim between Jesus' death and the writing of the New Testament accounts, or we could say when Christians began to believe. For frame of reference, the Gospels were written toward the end of the first century, beginning with Mark around 70 CE, some 40 years after the death of Jesus. The other Gospels are, of course, later. The epistles of Paul were written in the 50 CE, some 20 years after the death of Jesus. Of course, Paul's letters contain early Christian creeds, that attest to belief in the resurrection sometime prior to his writing, though we don't know when or where the, they come from, what their dating is. Firstly, myths can and do develop rapidly within zealous religious movements. Gershom Shalom speaks of the fast spreading legends and the sudden and almost explosive surge of miracle stories concerning the 17th century messianic figure Sabbatai Savi within his own lifetime, sometimes even weeks or days after he made public appearances. He says the sway of imagination was so strongly in evidence in the letters sent to Egypt and elsewhere, which by the autumn of 1665 had assumed the character of regular messianic propaganda in which fiction far outweighed the facts. 
the prophet was encompassed with a fiery cloud and the voice of an angel was heard from the cloud at the prophet's command great stones had fallen from heaven on the house of worship of the gentiles there are other such tales in these letters too such as him killing a highwayman with his very words escaping locked chains uh, magically i mean just a whole swarm of these tales that arose very early very rapidly with in a, within a movement where you had this kind of religious apocalyptic fervor secondly the notion that myths and legends cannot endure during the lifetimes of those who could dispute them is utterly false despite the military issuing statements that the object which crashed in roswell new mexico was a surveillance balloon both after the initial event in 1947 and again in 1994 many continue to promulgate conspiracy theories about a ufo cover-up at roswell and if you look at the image here uh there is your flying saucer there's your extraterrestrial technology it's a weather balloon forget it <laughs> False reports about widespread fraud and rigged voting machines in the 2020 presidential election have endured among Donald Trump fanatics, despite their being debunked by major news media outlets everywhere and Donald Trump's own attorney general, William Barr. Nothing more ironic than that Donald Trump was supposed to be uh, evangelical, Christianity's, evangelical Christianity's main man, and yet no one has done more than Donald Trump to expose the fallacies of apologetics. We've gotten a good close look at just how irrational people can be, the kind of sincere beliefs they can hold, even when they're just utterly demonstrably false. Thirdly, Christianity arose during a period of apocalyptic fervor, not unlike that of Sabbatai Savi, in which the kingdom of God and resurrection of the dead were imminently expected. Given these expectations, as well as numerous passages in the Hebrew scriptures which speak of redemption and exaltation, we should not be surprised that belief in the resurrection and exaltation of Christ developed rapidly. Early Christians were primed by their culture and religious expectations for just such a belief. Uh, if you ask me, I say yes, belief in the resurrection probably did arise quite early and for reasons that we would naturally expect. The 1 Corinthians 15 appearances. As noted earlier, 1 Corinthians 15 contains an early Christian creed that lists all those to whom the risen Jesus appeared, including Peter, the disciples, a group of 500 brothers all at once, then James, all the other apostles, and finally Paul himself. New Testament scholarship cogently demonstrates that these are theophanies, that is, appearances of the already exalted Christ who now dwells in heaven, not a revivified corpse who lives among the disciples in Judea, as in the later gospels, as I mentioned earlier. So the chronology of the earliest resurrection belief is expressed as resurrection, exaltation, and then appearances from heaven. These are divine theophanies. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean they didn't sincerely believe that they might have seen something, but that's what they are. This view is shared by various New Testament scholars, including Bart Ehrman, James Tabor, and M. David Litwa, just to list a few. Apologists argue that Paul must have received this creed from Peter and James during his visit to Jerusalem just three years after his conversion, as in Galatians 1. But this is sheer surmise, as Paul does not tell us where, when, or from whom he received the creed. Moreover, the creed is written in Greek, not Aramaic. These are not coming from the hands of the, the earliest disciples in Jerusalem. Paul remains our only firsthand witness to an appearance of the risen and exalted Jesus, which was a vision. Though he knew Peter and James, he was not an eyewitness to any purported events days after the crucifixion. And we have no independent attestation from any of the other 500 plus alleged witnesses, including Peter or James. Just as the missing body motif was common in the Hellenistic world, so too were post-mortem or post-mortal appearances to witnesses. Romulus, after being immortalized and translated to heaven, appeared to Proculus Julius and delivered a great commission for Rome. Asclepius, who was immortalized after death, appeared to Greeks and barbarians alike, including Maximus of Tyr, who wrote a first-hand account, and Antiochus of Agae. Why should we believe Paul any more than we believe Maximus of Tyr? 
Aristeus, after having died in a fuller's shop, appeared alive again to a man on the road to Cizicus as well as to many abroad. There was a man of Praetorian rank who swore an oath that he had seen the form of Caesar Augustus ascending to heaven. These myths are popular in the very time, the very day and age when Christianity is emerging. Probably not a coincidence. Why credit one and not the other? Even if early Christians did believe that the risen Jesus had appeared to them, so too did early Mormons believe that the angel Moroni appeared to them. In fact, we have far better evidence for the appearances of Moroni, including multiple first-hand eyewitness accounts. It was a clear, open, beautiful day, far from any inhabitants in a remote field at the time we saw the record of which it has been spoken brought and laid before us by an angel arrayed in glorious light ascend out of the midst of heaven now if this is human juggling judge ye from uh, witness eyewitness oliver cowdery just as sure as you see the sun shining just as sure I'm, just as sure am i that i stood in the presence of an angel of god who saw and saw him hold the gold plates in his hands from martin harris gentlemen do you see that are you sure you see it are your eyes playing a trick or something? No. Well, as sure as you see my hand, so sure did I see the angel and the plates. Again, from Martin Harris. The early Mormon accounts continued, I saw the Nephite artifacts just as plain as I see this bed, striking his hand upon the bed beside him. And I heard the voice of the Lord as distinctly as I ever heard anything in my life from David Whitmer. I was not under any hallucination, nor was I deceived. I saw with these eyes, and I heard with these ears. Again, from David Whitmer. Despite these witnesses breaking away from Joseph Smith, they stuck to their testimony until their dying day. Martin Harris later conceded that he only saw the angel in the plates in a visionary or entranced state, though this may also have been the case for early Christians, including Paul. Just read... 2 Corinthians 12, he speaks of this being visions and revelations. Other early witnesses to the angel Moroni include Mary Whitmer, Hiram Smith, Luke Johnson, Zara Pulsifer, W.W. Phelps, John P. Green and his wife Rhoda, John Taylor, Harrison Burgess, Heber C. Kimball, and Oliver Granger. Whatever one makes of these purported appearances of the angel Moroni, the fact remains that they are far better evidenced than the appearances of the risen Jesus. We have multiple first-hand eyewitness accounts and nearly a dozen people who corroborated their experience with similar visions. Far better evidence for the appearances of the angel Moroni than for Jesus. And it still is incredible. Critical New Testament scholarship has long recognized that the Gospels are anonymous works written primarily in third-person narrative form without ever identifying themselves as Mark, Matthew, Luke, or John. This concerns eyewitness testimony. All four of the canonical Gospels were originally anonymous. It was only in the second century CE when the four Gospels were published as a collection that the superscriptions were added to the Gospels, attributing authorship to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, respectively. This is also the time that traditions begin to appear about the authors, claiming that they were either original apostles of Jesus or close acquaintances of other well-known apostles. In spite of these attributions, most scholars do not think any of these men were the original gospel writers. None of the gospels is written in a style that suggests the authors were present at the event being narrated. I'm going to repeat that. None of the Gospels is written in a style that suggests the authors were present at the events being narrated. Just read the Gospels for yourself. <clears throat> Nor is it likely that the disciples of Jesus were able to write in Greek the language in which the Gospels were written. So we are left with the reality that the Gospels were written by anonymous Christians decades after the events that they relate. From David M. Carr and Colleen M. Conway, an introduction to the Bible, sacred texts, and imperial contexts. Apologists appeal to early church fathers, such as Papias and Irenaeus, who claim that Mark was written by an interpreter of Peter and Luke by a companion of Paul, while Matthew compiled the Lord's sayings in the original Aramaic. 
Internal evidence for these traditional claims of gospel authorship is simply non-existent. Mark gives no hint of receiving his information from Peter, nor does Luke do so with Paul. Matthew does contain Semitic idioms, but was nevertheless written in Greek, as are all the others, and relies heavily on material from Mark, which would hardly have been necessary if written by an eyewitness with his own recollection of the events. In answer to this, an answer to Matthew's reliance upon Mark, apologists argue that although an eyewitness, Matthew valued Peter's testimony as provided by Mark. This makes little sense given that Matthew regarded Mark as in need of constant correction. If he valued Mark's gospel so much because this is Peter's testimony, why is he constantly fixing and correcting him? Do see Robert and Price, the case against the case for Christ, pages 22 through 24, where he just absolutely annihilates this particular defense. Both Papias and in here Irenaeus were prone to fanciful claims, such as Papias's description of Judas Iscariot swelling to the size of a chariot and oozing live worms, uh, or Irenaeus's suggestion that Jesus lived to nearly 50 years of age. These guys were not beyond fudging things or passing on total nonsense. Therefore, we just cannot look to them as actual uh, reliable sources. The evangelists are omniscient third-person storytellers, as evidenced from the fact that they report what transpired in the wilderness while Jesus was alone for 40 days, as well as the words he prayed while away from the sleeping disciples in Gethsemane. If this were an eyewitness writing, he'd be like, you know, I was there, but uh, he had stepped away to pray all by himself, and I really couldn't tell you what words he prayed. No, the author knows this because he's the omniscient storyteller, storyteller who's narrating the story, not an eyewitness, a storyteller uh, crafting the narrative. Professor of New Testament and early Christianity, Robin Walsh, cogently argues that the synoptic gospels were written by elite cultural producers working within a dynamic cadre of literate specialists, including persons who may or may not have been professed Christians. Comparing a range of ancient literature, her groundbreaking study demonstrates that the Gospels are creative works produced by educated elites. That's from the publisher's description of her book, The Origins of Early Christian Literature. Um, I highly suggest watching her interview on the Myth Vision podcast with Derek. It's a total game changer, a total paradigm shift, and it makes absolute and total sense given just the the, the sheer uh, the number of, of Hellenistic Greco-Roman motifs that we find present in the Gospels. They're familiar with the works of Homer, as uh, Dennis McDonald points out, Ovid, Livy, th they've got to be. And that's why you see these tropes. They are Greco-Roman, uh, even if they are Jewish, they're very Hellenized Jews, part of the educated elite. There are a couple of instances in which the Gospels, though not written by eyewitnesses, claim to rely on eyewitness testimony. The introduction to Luke's Gospel, in which the stories of Jesus were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, and the 21st chapter of John's Gospel, in which it is the disciple whom Jesus loved who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. Such literary devices were common to Greek historians and biographers of the time, even when writing highly embellished or fictional accounts. So as an example, reading uh, chapter one, beginning of Luke, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Special note, Luke Acts is probably second century as cogently argued by several scholars, including Josephan expert Steve Mason. Uh, the coincidence of aim, themes, and vocabulary seems to suggest that Luke Acts is building its case on the foundation of, Joseph of Josephus's 
defense of Judaism. Check out Josephus in the New Testament. I'm not going to do a deep dive for you uh, for you here as far as that goes, but do check out Steve Mason's presentations on the Myth Vision podcast with Derek. Uh, other scholars argue this as well, and it's it's entirely convincing given the the kind of strange coincidences between Josephus and Luke Acts. So uh, in comparison with Luke's introduction, this is from the letter of Aristeus. This is a Jew writing about the translation of the Hebrew Bible into the Greek Septuagint in Alexandria, Egypt. He's writing about uh, his, his experience investigating this. Since I have collected material for a memorable history of my visit to Eliezer, the high priest of the Jews, and because you, Philocrates, as you lose no opportunity of reminding me, have set great store upon receiving an account of the motives and object of my mission, I have attempted to draw up a clear exposition of the matter for you. It was my devotion to the pursuit of religious knowledge that led me to undertake the embassy to the man I have mentioned, who was held in the highest esteem by his own citizens and by others both for his virtue and his majesty, and who had in his possession documents of the highest value to the Jews in his own country and in foreign lands for the interpretation of the divine law. On a former occasion, too, I sent you a record of the facts which I thought worth relating about the Jewish race the record which I had obtained from the most learned high priests of the most learned land of Egypt. As you were so eager to acquire the knowledge of those things which can benefit the mind, I feel it incumbent upon me to impart to you all the information in my power. So Aristeus is writing as an eyewitness who's investigating these things, talking to people on the scene in Alexandria. Historians agree that this account is entirely fictional. He's, he's trying to, to impress you with all the verisimilitude uh, as Luke is, but it's still an entirely fictional account. Philostratus, Life of Apollonius. It seems to me that uh, then that I ought not to condone or acquiesce in the general ignorance, but write a true account of the man, detailing the exact times at which he said or did this or that as also the habits and temper of wisdom by means of which he succeeded in being considered a supernatural and divine being. And I have gathered my information partly from the many cities where he was loved, and partly from the temples whose long neglected and decayed rites he restored, and partly from the accounts left of him by others, and partly from his own letters. For he addressed these to kings, sophists, philosophers, to men of Elas, of Delphi, to Indians and Ethiopians, and in his letters, he dealt with the subjects of the gods, of customs, of moral principles, of laws. And in all these departments, he corrected the errors into which men had fallen. But the more precise details which I have collected are as follows. So Philostratus is writing up a true detailed account uh, from talking uh, to people in the cities where he was known. Nevertheless, gives us a highly fictitious and embellished account of the man Philostratus containing many of the same mythic motifs as we find in the Gospels. Uh, healing the sick, raising the dead, miraculous conception, ascending to heaven, all the same stuff. So this is why, despite uh, Luke's attempt at verisimilitude, we're not buying it. The women as witness, apologists argue that the testimony of women was so distrusted in the ancient world that nobody would invent such a story as female witnesses to the empty tomb. By the criterion of embarrassment, the story must be true. They were just stuck with the, the, the blunt fact of the, of the women having discovered the tomb, the argument goes. This gravely misunderstands the genre of the Gospels. They are Greco-Roman prose biographies, not Palestinian legal documents. This is not taking place in a court setting. That's not what they are. Women were commonly associated with burial and mourning procedures. Ezekiel 8, 14 attests to women mourning the slain Tammuz at the gates of the Jerusalem temple. Jeremiah 9, 17 through 20 speaks of women mourning for Israel in the time of the Babylonian conquest. Uh, in rabbinic times, funeral processions were led by lamenting female mourners, often professionals. Women also composed elegies that were chanted aloud as evidenced by the Talmud's inclusion of eight elegies attributed to the women of Shokin Zeb in Babylon. Prohibitions against women's voices being heard in public 
were relaxed for funerary rituals. That's from death and bereavement in Judaism, ancient burial practices from the Encyclopedia Judaica. Women played a big role in this. Now, men were involved in burial and funeral duties as well, as apologists are keen to point out, but it was such a common role among women that its portrayal in the Gospels is unsurprising. We would expect this to be there from a narrator. They're not Palestinian legal documents. This is not a court setting. Now we're going to get into N.T. Wright's argument for the resurrection, which is unique, uh, anachronistic anastasis. Apologist N.T. Wright has popularized the argument from anachronistic anastasis, suggesting that the resurrection of a single individual ahead of the general resurrection in Judaism is so unprecedented that no ancient Jew could have conceived of it unless it were simply true. This presupposes that ideas are static and unchanging, not susceptible to modification, which is obviously false. The very idea of resurrection in the Hebrew Bible morphs from metaphorical expressions of the restoration of Israel to literal resurrection of the dead by the time we get to Daniel. Ideas are subject to change and ancient Jews were no exception. Mark 6, 14 to 16 tells of Herod proclaiming that Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Evidently, resurrection ahead of the end times was conceivable to some Jews, even if in this case it was not to a mortal life. Uh, so it's clear John the Baptist, he didn't live again forever, but there's still a, an idea of resurrection ahead of the general resurrection of the dead. Uh, how difficult could it have been to believe if you believe that someone had been raised again to mortal life? It's not much of a step further to believe that someone could have been raised to immortal life. These were Hellenized Jews among whom stories had long circulated about the immortalization and exaltation of individual figures like Romulus, Asclepius, and Heracles, as well as their own Enoch, Elijah, and Moses. Wright argues that in contrast to Enoch and others, Jesus is depicted as raised from death resurrection, not translated while still alive. Obviously, this is because A, Jesus had actually died, no escaping that fact, and B, resurrection was not a prominent theme until later in the Second Temple period. Concerning Enoch, Elijah, and Moses, of course, Wright will say that in relation to these figures, no texts use the language of resurrection, but that is specious. The language was not used because in the minds of the authors and their communities, they had not died. For me, a key consideration is whether the relevant authors hold an anthropology that a complete human being is somehow embodied. As far as I can tell, they all do, and thus we are talking about transformed or exalted humanity akin to what Paul perceives will happen to those who are alive at the parousia of Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 15. The only difference is that these patriarchs are singled out for transformation ahead of all the rest. We should also take note that none of the traditions about these figures dispenses with the body or simply talks about the ascent of the soul to heaven. So this is not as unique as Wright would have us believe. Even though Jesus' story entails resurrection, of course it did, because he had actually died. These other figures were never known or thought to have died. Concerning Greek ideas of post-mortem and post-mortal immortality, uh, even David Litwin just excoriates Wright on this point. Over and over again, Wright avoids speaking about the corporeal implications of post-mortem transformation in Mediterranean culture, repeatedly stressing that Greeks and Romans envisioned a transformation of the soul, not the body. To make this move plausible, Wright effectively canonizes Plato calling his writings the New Testament for the Hellenized world. As Doc Osteen Enzo points out, however, making Plato's doctrine of the immortal soul staple fare for ancient Mediterranean peoples, in particular non-philosophers, is a distortion of the general climate of thought, especially in the first century CE. One has the lingering sense that Wright's account of Plato's cultural ubiquity is meant to reinforce his tendentious view that pagans emphasized only the immortality of the soul, leaving corporeal immortalization or resurrection of the body to Jews and Christians. 
recent scholarship, in particular the work of Enzo, has overturned this outdated notion. Wright's highly apologetic attempt to establish the uniqueness of Jesus' resurrection fails because of a superficial comparison. Jesus' resurrection much more resembles the stories of deified men immortalized after their deaths. These men are not just immortalized in their souls, but in their bodies as well, contra right. Uh, examples, Asclepius appears in full bodily presence to both Greeks and barbarians, per Celsus, not as a mere phantom. Romulus appears in shining armor greater than human, per Ovid. And Heracles' weight is felt in the heavens where he marries and procreates. You've got to have a body to do that, even if it's a spiritual divine body like Jesus has per Paul. The resurrection of Jesus is directly tied into and associated with the general resurrection of the dead, as he was the first fruits of all those to be raised, per 1 Corinthians, uh, which was expected imminently. As Giza Vermes put it, Jesus' resurrection is treated as the anticipation and cause of the reawakening of the dead at the end of time. So it's, it's directly tied into associated with the general resurrection of the dead still. This represents an unsurprising innovation on the Jewish theme of resurrection from the dead, wherein a single individual inaugurates the process. Such innovation is to be expected within religious movements, especially given changes in historical, cultural, and sociological factors. Innovation, therefore, does not require a miraculous explanation or occurrence. The resurrection of Jesus fits the mold of translated and exalted figures before him, including, as we mentioned, Enoch, Elijah, Romulus, Asclepius, and Heracles. Whether such figures were said to have died or not, and note, Asclepius and Heracles did. The historical fact of Jesus' death was simply unavoidable, requiring resurrection in order to reverse his death and proclaim him alive. All such figures underwent corporeal immortalization. Like Jesus, they were exalted and transformed immortal divine bodies. Highly suggesting uh, reading that was uh, Jesus Dios, pages 141 to 179, that whole chapter where he just takes this apart and uh, absolutely deconstructs it. Then we get to Occam's razor, wielding Occam's razor. Apologists assert that the argument to the best explanation involving the least ad hoc assumptions is the mere fact of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. That's what best fits the data. Settling for the simplest explanation risks arriving at dubious and oversimplified explanations. We could just as well argue that the simplest explanation for multiple accounts of the appearances of those such as Romulus, Asclepius, or Moroni is that they really had manifested themselves to others. You wouldn't argue that for them. Why would you do it for Jesus? Explanations must be not only parsimonious, but sufficiently compelling and well-evidenced with proper correspondence to background knowledge. They should be plausible. Naturalistic explanations for the emergence of belief in Jesus' resurrection are not far-fetched or convoluted. Cognitive dissonance reduction, for example, is a common phenomenon in zealous religious movements. The unexpected and tragic death of a messianic hopeful like Jesus resulting in proclamations that he lived again in heaven at the right hand of God and would soon return is easily explainable as cognitive dissonance reduction in the face of crisis, especially since a host of scriptural, mythical, and cultural antecedents laid the foundation for just such a rationalization. The 1 Corinthians 15 Creed tells us explicitly that Christ was raised according to the scriptures. This is a simple and direct clue for unveiling the provenance of early resurrection belief. The expressions of death and redemption or exaltation supplied by Isaiah, Hosea, the Psalms, and elsewhere. Check out Lloyd Gearing, Resurrection as an Idiom for Exaltation, in his uh, online book, Resurrection, a Symbol of Hope. Again, you can find this online if you Google it. It's a great read and uh, very uh, meticulously, cogently, explains how Jesus' resurrection is something right out of the Hebrew scriptures. So time for a recap. Strong evidence. Remember I said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, or at least compelling evidence or sufficient evidence 
Does this get us there? There is no direct or reliable evidence that the earliest followers of Jesus were made to recant their faith on pain of death. And even if they were, fanatics and zealous religious and political movements have willingly died for demonstrably false beliefs, even when they were in a position to know better. On our earliest sources, we cannot know whether Jesus was buried in the tomb or a cis grave. Exhuming the body of Jesus would have proven pointless as it would have decomposed by the time the resurrection was being preached. The empty tomb narrative smacks of the widespread missing body motif of ancient apotheosis legends. Myths and legends arise rapidly within zealous religious movements, and early Christians were primed for resurrection exaltation belief. Hostile witnesses against such events often have no impact whatsoever. They are no match for the sheer will to believe. Appearances of the risen Jesus are sparsely evidenced. Post-mortal and post-mortem appearances were common coin in the ancient world, and we have far better evidence for the appearances of the angel Moroni, which still strains credulity. The Gospels are not eyewitness accounts. They are third-person prose narratives written by educated Greco-Roman elites. Though they lay claim to eyewitness lineage in a few brief places, this too was common coin in ancient storytelling, even fictional accounts. The women on scene at the empty tomb is precisely what we would expect from a narrator given their prominent role in burial and mourning procedures. The Gospels are not Palestinian legal documents. So this is the final portion of the presentation discussing the resurrection hypothesis. What is the resurrection hypothesis? Quote from William Lane Craig in his debate with Bart Ehrman. Dr. Ehrman just assumes that the probability of the resurrection on our background knowledge is very low. But here, I think he's confused. What, after all, is the resurrection hypothesis? It's the hypothesis uh, that Jesus rose supernaturally from the dead. It is not the hypothesis that Jesus rose naturally from the dead. That Jesus rose naturally from the dead is fantastically improbable. But I see no reason whatsoever to think that it is improbable that God raised Jesus from the dead. In order to show that that hypothesis is improbable, you'd have to show that God's existence is improbable. Well, Dr. Craig, Challenge accepted, because we don't have to show that any God's existence is improbable, just yours, the biblical God. Craig is partially correct. The resurrection per New Testament theology is not a matter of Jesus having naturally arisen from the dead. It is the claim that God raised Jesus from the dead. This God is none other than Yahweh the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as the New Testament affirms. This presents an insurmountable problem for the resurrection hypothesis. The biblical Yahweh, the only God associated with the resurrection of Jesus, is extraordinarily unlikely to exist. Quote, the biblical God is a character in Hebrew narrative, and therefore is, in a very real sense, a figure of fiction. That's from Robert Carroll, professor of Hebrew Bible and Semitic studies, someone who knows what he's talking about. The biblical Yahweh appears to be an entirely fictional construct, a Canaanite storm god analogous to Baal, who likewise belonged to a pantheon of mythic deities as the son of the high god El, and likewise battled with mythological creatures like Leviathan and Yam. Yahweh, like Baal, is depicted as a storm deity, has thunder as his voice, hurls the lightning like a spear or shoots it like an arrow, is designated as a, as a rider of the clouds, just like Baal, is depicted as a son of El, especially in Deuteronomy 32, defeated the serpent Leviathan, or the Ugaritan, U, Ugaritan uh, Lotan, and had a conflict with Yom, the sea. This comes from Jaco Garrick's Does Yahweh Exist? A Critique of Realism in Old Testament Theology. I'm only giving you little snippets of his work. You've got to check it out. You can find it on academia.edu. The biblical Yahweh is depicted in explicitly anthropomorphic terms with all the apparent features of primitive human projection. 
Yahweh has human form. Yahweh looks like an aged man. Yahweh has eyes. Yahweh has ears. Yahweh has a mouth. Yahweh has lips. Yahweh has a tongue. Yahweh has a face. Yahweh has a backside. More than that, Yahweh has a heart. Yahweh has hands and fingers. Yahweh has arms. Yahweh has a nose with which to smell pleasant aromas, the carcasses of burning animals. Yahweh even has feet. Again, you've got to see Jack O'Garrick's Does Yahweh Exist? A Critique of Realism in Old Testament Theology. Contra theologians, these are not merely metaphors for a transcendent immaterial being. The notion that the biblical God is pure spirit is something that historically arose from sociocultural pressures and shifts in thought. This is from Francesca Stavrikopoulos' God and Anatomy. The God of modern Abrahamic religion was assembled over the course of 2,000 years from selected scraps of ancient Jewish mysticism, Greek philosophy, Christian doctrine, Protestant iconoclasm, and European colonialism. It was the cultural heft of certain forms of philosophical abstraction that altered the original view of God. The emergence of Greek versions of the Hebrew scriptures in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE had encouraged the gradual and seemingly natural metamorphosis of ancient Levantine mythology into cutting-edge Jewish metaphysics. In a Greco-Roman world in which Judaism and its subsequent Christian inflections were minority religions, some Jewish and Christian intellectuals were keen to demonstrate the erudite, sophisticated truths of their own theologies by identifying the God of their scriptures with constructs of the, of the supreme divine in Greek philosophy. Qualities and attributes of the Jewish and Christian God were instinctively but insistently mapped onto broadly platonic abstractions, references to God's anatomical features, such as his head, hands, and feet, became increasingly complex metaphors and multi-layered allegories. This is what the Greeks did with many of their gods, with Zeus even, is uh, they, they got to a point where, we, where they said, this is too crude and we need to allegorize it. So what happened to the Jewish god Yahweh as well? No, these are not metaphors for something else. They became metaphors for historical reasons. God and anatomy continued. The Christian construct of God as a transcendent, invisible, and incorporeal being is a distorted refraction, not a reflection, of the biblical image of God. The real God of the Bible was an ancient Levantine deity whose footsteps shook the earth, whose voice thundered through the skies. This was also a God who wept and talked and slept and sulked, a God who felt and fought and loved and lost, a God who sometimes failed and sometimes triumphed. This was a God more like the best of us and the worst of us, a God made in our own image. The biblical God was created in our image, not the other way around. He is, as Robert Carroll said, a figure of fiction. I'm not saying I know this about any gods or any kind of vague uh, ambiguous God concept, but about the biblical Yahweh, yes, I am. Fascinating though his history may be, a fictional character cannot do anything, much less raise someone from the dead. This is akin to saying that Marduk, Zeus, or Papa Smurf raised Jesus from the dead. The resurrection hypothesis fails because it requires the action of a wholly imaginary entity, born out of ancient myth and modified by human abstraction over the centuries. The New Testament makes it abundantly clear that the risen Christ was supposed to return soon to inaugurate the kingdom of God and fulfill messianic prophecy. I've got a whole host of New Testament uh, chapter and verse to, to see just how imminently this was expected. Nowhere is this more explicit than in Matthew 16, 28, where Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The risen Jesus was supposed to return within the very lifetime of his own disciples. Instead, he remains relegated to an unseen realm 
like every other immortalized figure in antiquity, Romulus, Asclepius, Heracles, all the rest. That's how you make the belief unfalsifiable. The argument to the best explanation involving the least ad hoc assumptions here is that Jesus is nowhere to be found because he was never actually raised to begin with. And this is unsurprising given that one, people do not rise from the dead. Two, for someone to be raised from the dead would require a miracle. And three, the only divine entity ever proposed to perform such a miracle for Jesus, the only supernatural agent that would be motivated or expected to do so is a fictive construct of hoary tradition and human imagination. If indeed there was a historical Jesus, but no true Yahweh to raise him, then Jesus is dead. I end with the eulogy. This is from Joseph McCabe, uh, his 1926 publication, The Myth of the Resurrection. Historically, there is only the slenderest of evidence of his actual words. It is not likely that anybody kept a record. He had not the slightest idea of founding a new religion, living in history, or influencing all men. He believed that the earth would be destroyed long before they could hear of him in Rome. The Gospels are compilations of Jewish and pagan moral sentiments of the time, harmonizing with the Asinian elements of the ideas of Jesus. Goodbye, pale Galilean. It was not your fault that priests made a normal rule of life of the emergency councils of austerity, which you gave in the belief that the end of the world was nigh. You're not responsible for the Middle Ages. They used you. It seems that according to your poor light, you played a man's part. You denounced priests and priestcraft, and you told men to love one another. You were faithful to the end, by all accounts. You died for what you thought to be truth and the welfare of men. We think differently. Life is good and glorious. Love is the very flower of its sap. But we feel nearer to you than to the priests who affect to speak in your name. Goodbye, dear Galilean. Say fini. That is the end of the presentation. Thank you for joining. Oh, snap. I got goosebumps. I got goosebumps from that. Derek, that was uh, <clears throat> that was really good, bro. Uh, that was really good. So you did not let my expectations down at all. Really impressed. As always, you bring high caliber. So thank you, man. Really appreciate that. And I hope everybody in the chat appreciated it as well. Um, We'll go to q and I, I, I don't want to run like I, I love having the audience feel like they're able to participate and to enjoy that. So I also appreciate the support that comes in through Super Chat. So um, let's start at the top again. Just shout out to Scott Daniel. Thank you for that Super Chat, Scott. And that super sticker, Jason. Really appreciate that. Let's get this first one by Mr. Monster. And uh, we'll just keep going going along here, Derek. Is it possible instead of resurrecting, he just got resuscitated after hanging for six hours? Although that would that wouldn't explain how he would survive bloody gashes from being whipped in his back. Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? No. <laughs> um, you know, I've I've watched plenty of documentaries and read up on uh, crucifixion. Um, as most of you surely know, it was a pretty horrific process. More than likely, it was going to kill you. So sure, I mean, it's remotely possible, but I would say very unlikely. I will happily grant the minimal fact that uh, Jesus died by being crucified. Interesting, interesting. All right, we'll get to the next one. Alan Bird coming through with some love. Good to see you here. Thank you for that super chat. Just sending some love your way. I have been absent from live chats for a while. Life is suddenly busy. I totally get it. And it's great to see you here, Alan. If you're still in the chat, love you. Thank you for the support. Of course, you're also on the Patreon as well. So it's always good to see you. All right, getting to the next super chat here. And it's Neo Fight One. Good to see you here again. Josephus mentions many felled messiahs whose movements died with them. Why would a felled apocalyptic prophet who met a humiliating death be different? That is a fantastic question. And I was almost hoping somebody would answer. Um, why is it that this happened to Jesus and none of these other felled messiahs? And to be completely honest with you, 
you know, I don't know for sure. All I would say is that oftentimes just right person, right place, right time. I mean, why, you know, with all the religious revivalism that was going on in Joseph Smith's day, why did he get to be the prophet who founded a whole new religion? Um, you know, oftentimes it's just a matter of Darwinian natural selection, you know, and for all we know, I mean, we don't have records. Maybe other Feld messiahs were divinized in this way or thought to have been raised and exalted at the right hand of God. We don't know. I mean, you can't really make a, an argument from silence to say that none were. Maybe they were, but we just we simply do not have any record of it. But as to why Jesus was, whereas none others were, that that's my answer to that is simply right person, right place, right time, just good old Darwinian selection. Um, if you don't find that to be a satisfying answer, all I can say is that that's much more likely than that it really happened. Like, uh, you can't use that argument to say, well, what happened here with Jesus is utterly unique. Therefore, it must be true. That's just a non sequitur. Um, why is it that, you know, any prophet, any, any, anyone who, who becomes, you know, greatly renowned, when there are many other individuals who are just as skilled, just as talented, just as knowledgeable, just as charismatic, uh, they could have been the ones to to be given the spotlight. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, it's just right person, right place, right time. It's the historical circumstances. There's also a lot that factors into this. Um, those who follow a movement might be people who can actually carry the weight of the movement's development and growth. Uh, for example, you mentioned Joseph Smith. Well, um, one of his followers, uh, I can't believe I'm not able to think of his name. He was the prophet. Uh, I can't even think. Nathan of Gaza? Nope. Nope. He dealt with all the financial. Oh, the I'm, I'm very, very yeah. organized too. member of the, of the movement. And he knew how to, how to handle the money, how to handle the business. The point is, the movement would have been far smaller and would probably not have succeeded as well if it weren't for a follower of that movement. So there's True. other factors that could play a part in, in a, and we'll move to the next super chat. Just something yeah, to if, think if, about. I'll, I'll say if it hadn't been for the apostle Paul, we probably never would have heard of Christianity. It would have gone the extinct. One popularized it among the Gentiles. So, it, you know, we have Paul to thank for a lot of that. Right. And I, that doesn't mean he's the creator of it, but there's definitely a version no, of it that no, comes from him. And, and, um, an interesting possible note, if we're going into what could have happened, there was a young boy who drew the destruction of the Twin Towers before they were actually destroyed. Uh, he, he drew a, pl a plane crashing into the Twin Towers. And um, sure enough, well, what happened? Is he a prophet? Well, in those days, you got to imagine, there's not a natural explanation that the kid lived nearby. He watched planes fly in the sky and knew that the towers were in the sky. And one plus one equals two. And boom. Well, was Jesus an apocalyptic Qumran type figure who may have said, I don't like the temple leadership. I don't like what's going on here, just like the Qumran sect. And sure enough, one plus one, well, you're wicked and you're in the temple. Babylon's going to happen all over again because you, you guys... And it happens. Next thing you know, they say, he predicted this. And next thing you know, we have fictional letters written or whatever, fictional uh, gospels, etc. You can postulate stuff. All of it's speculative, but it's all possible. And it's not like requiring an, a supernatural explanation is the point. Why Muhammad? Why did he become the, 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 the well-known prophet of his time to inspire a whole new religion, Islam. Surely there were other Arabic peoples preaching were. similar messages. It's just a, a matter of the chips falling where they may. Thank you so much for that. Amy Elf, thank you for that super sticker. I appreciate the support. Moving on down. Uh, Chendi, thank you for the super chat. Apologists seldom contend with the fact that according to Christianity, Jesus is still alive with the same physical body he had. In other words, Jesus is 2,000 years old with a human body. How? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, what the ancients would say is that he had been transformed into uh, a, a spiritual divine body. This doesn't mean that he was a mere ghost. didn't mean that for Romulus or Asclepius either. But they, they understood this. They understood the flesh 
gets weak, grows old, and, and dies. So it cannot be a body like we have now, now because the body now we know goes to crap. <laughs> so they would have to have a new uh, divine body. And, and, you know, what Paul is saying for Jesus is pretty much standard fare, you know, for, uh, for other demigods, heroes, and, and uh, divinities. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that Christians, while they say he rose in his body, it, it's, it's almost like a horrible analogy to use here. I'm just going to give a natural, like, hunters go out, they kill a deer, and then they have it stuffed, and boom, like, the body is immortalized on the wall so now it doesn't uh, age okay that's what they would contend with jesus so to speak horrible analogy all right <laughs> melody joy thank you for the super sticker i really appreciate you for the support and always just cheerleading in the chat asking people to like the videos all of that seriously i love the support and thank you so much Stuart c a gold-plated super chat miraculously appears from the midst of patreon supporter heaven <laughs> thank you Stuart. he is a patron of myth vision seriously um thankful for you and your support derek bennett is also on patreon and mm -hmm. i am a patron of his uh i support his work as you see today so with the 550 people watching consider supporting if you like what you're hearing because that's what makes him want to come back and do more of this he actually spent a couple weeks putting this together and exhaustive work so i said all right and i'm you know i'm paying him for his time i'm very transparent about this so i value him as an academic on this level doc pleromonot good to see you my friend thank you for the support are we really to believe pilot allowed jewish removal of an insurrectionist from the cross given Pax August Augusta, the displayed Spartan rebel corpse lining the Via Appia expressed the norm. Yeah, I, I would say uh, the good doctor knows more about that kind of thing than I do. I was simply happy to grant, for the sake of argument, Dale Allison's position that when Paul says burial, the 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 denotation or at least the connotation is such that it would have at least been an honorable burial of some sort. So I, I don't want to even just, I don't want to bother wasting any time arguing with the apologists on that point. I'm happy to just give it to you and say, okay, honorable burial, fine. Uh, that still doesn't prove that he was placed in the tomb. But, um, you know, I, I know Airman is uh, of the mind that the Romans would not have allowed them to have the body back, but th there are apologetic arm arguments against that as well mm -hmm. um i've i've just not spent too much time uh focused on that so there's like one be right. yeah there's like one account i think philo mentions of someone being granted permission uh in some some one rare occurrence we see this this like a serious like a serious political involvement as to why so it would require a lot more than a few uh fishermen uh and and Maybe, maybe the fictional Joseph of Arimathea found money and uh, said, "Hey, I'll pay you a, a chunk of money." I don't yeah. know. Joseph Thank you so Bastard, much, Joseph of Best Disciple Town. Yeah, exactly. Um, going to the next super chat here. Just covering the questions. I apologize. Well, for a while there, it was you know you were giving a dense presentation, and so people were probably just listening, which is awesome. That tells me that people are actually listening and not like just ready to respond. So I'm thankful that you're doing that. AJ Mart, thank you for the super sticker, my friend. Dharma Defender, good to see you in here. 515 witnesses and Christians preserved none of them. It's not called pious fraud for nothing. <laughs> now we're left with fraudulent eyewitness reports that are anything except actual eyewitnesses. Thanks. Agreed. I was going to say, uh, comment, please. I mean, 500, 500 plus witnesses. Now, you know, to be fair, uh, most people were not literate back then. So we have to take that into account. But you're telling me 500, half a thousand people had seen this? And, and we don't have any independent corroboration from any of them. I'm sorry, it's baloney. <laughs> well put, Dharma. Thank you for that super chat, my friend. 
And uh, great point. Mr. Monster, thank you, my friend, for the super chat. Very cool and informative presentation. Thank you, Derek. And once again, very good and informative presentation. Wow, you doubled down. He doubled down on the thank you. So thank you. I, too, felt like it was very good and informative. Uh, dude, it really was. It was a really well put uh, presentation. Chendi, thank you so much for this uh, super chat. In reference to Mormonism, I reckon he is Brigham Young. That's exactly who I was talking about. If it weren't for him, especially in the whole Mormonism series that I did with Fitzgerald and um, why can't I think of uh, our friend? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, historically, Brigham Young played such a significant role in like the development of Mormonism and its popularity. But it is interesting to point out Joseph Smith in his own life, during his life, this guy had people who were close to him, who doubted him, who apostatized. Uh, the Gospels say that much, too, that some doubted. Uh, there's just so many interesting things to consider, too. I, I've had a... What's going on with you, man? Like, are I'm you, bored out here. I, I'm seeing through a glass dimly, but then face-to-face. <laughs> -face, I don't understand what's going on. Yeah, you're always not too pleased with my presentation. Huh. Huh. Thank you for that uh, clarification. My brain is not working well today. Dance Slob, thank you so much for the super chat. Why would we trust you guys when you have said in the past that Jesus never existed? Even Ehrman admits he did. What else are you guys wrong about? That's a fair question, actually, because, you know, this person's right. I did used to argue for mythicism, and you know, and you, you used to believe it, too. Mm -hmm. um, the important, the salient point is that through careful study and investigation, uh, being open minded, being open minded. There you are. You're clear. I came, yeah. I came to realize that this argument didn't. I personally just I don't think it holds much water. Um, I think I don't think that the evidence for Jesus's historicity is overwhelming by any means, but I think that there's at least enough there to where to where we can be pretty confident that there was such a guy, and that it makes the most sense of Christian origins. So you know, all conclusions are indeed tentative and provisional, as as Robert Price says. And I and I you know I'm always willing to remain open-minded and and take another look at the evidence, but. There also comes a point, uh, dance slob, where the cumulative data and arguments are such that you can be fairly certain about something. And that's how I feel about the resurrection. Um, I'm sorry, but a fictional deity cannot have raised Jesus from the dead. I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me that Yahweh is a fictional deity, um, I, I will not, I will not have changed their minds. Yeah. As I said, this is a defense of non-belief. You know, the corollary to what Dr. Craig said, he said in order to show that the resurrection is improbable, you'd have to show that God's existence is improbable. Well, let's be clear, we're talking about the biblical God, right? So the, co the corollary is this. In order to show that the resurrection is probable, you'd have to show that the biblical God's existence is probable. Yahweh. Good luck with that. Mm. And just uh, to answer, since he mentioned plural here, you guys, um, I don't want you to trust me. <laughs> I don't want you to. I don't trust me sometimes. Because that's why I go and try to refer to people who know more than I do. Uh, that's the whole channel. The whole channel is to get people who know more than me, articulate better than me, are aware of things more than me. And you don't need to trust them either. But it's good to collect data and to try and piece together what's going on. And once you get enough of that information, you start to get a picture that makes clear sense. And you know, in the Christian's mind, the Christian message makes clear sense. The resurrection was true. And I know that because I was one. So it's not just that I used to argue that Jesus never existed. I don't close the door on the idea because it's not ridiculous to assume that it's that's not a possibility. Um, but at the same time, I also used to believe Jesus was God in the flesh uh, and part of the Trinity. 
And uh, I wouldn't expect you to trust me. A guy who came from that to having a video about Jesus is dead. It's a big step. So, um, yeah, I, I love the super chat. I'm thankful for the questions mm -hmm. and the support. I just want you to know, don't trust me. Don't trust Derek. Definitely also don't trust the apologists who are feeding you what you want to hear if you are a Christian. Just saying, go into this and be skeptical. Say, I don't know. Maybe the resurrection did happen. Maybe it didn't. Let me look into the data. And if you actually approached it that way, you can, I think, maybe value and appreciate both sides to some degree, not being completely uh, dismissive and throwing the baby out with the bathwater or demonizing people who do believe, but at the same time, draw your own conclusions. And for me, I think we have saw the presentation today, and this is right in the vein of all the other academics I've been bringing on for quite some time. It makes a lot of sense. So anyway, long rant. Apologies. Tux TV, thank you for the super chat. Justin Martyr wondered how the devil created the Eucharist in Mysteries of Mithras. Assuming the devil is able to create religions, how likely is the Christian satanic worship? Uh, I mean, Justin Martyr did say that. Um, I'm just trying to get a better handle on the question. Justin Martyr wondered how the devil created the Eucharist. In the mysteries of Mithras, assuming the devil is able to create religions, how likely is the Christian satanic? War I, I just don't understand the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, he wondered. So Justin Martyr wondered how the devil created the Eucharist and mysteries of Mithras. Assuming the devil is able to create religions, how likely is the Christian satanic worship? So I suspect... Uh, we don't know the likelihood, but like <laughs> if, if we granted the world view that the devil actually is doing these things, like playing a hypothetical here, is Christianity itself satanic? If this is real, a Jew might say if, if, if there was a second temple Jew who thought of Satan, maybe in New Testament terms, that wasn't necessarily a Christian, they would have thought this is probably satanic, especially if, if, if Jesus, according to the Gospels, is saying that Jews are the spawn of Satan, okay, uh, what were they saying about them? I suspect they thought the same. You, you're evildoers. You satanic seed. You, who knows? I, I mean, it's a, it's a wonder. It makes you wonder what was said. So, I'm just, a, I'm assuming that's what was meant by the question. Doc Laromanat is back with the heavy hitting questions. Thank you, Doc. An aggregate reading of the Gospels does not produce the monolithic narrative that is often presupposed, yet the dubious empty tomb persists as if it were synonymous with the risen Jesus. And I, I you know, <laughs> I mean, given the prevalence of these apotheosis narratives where the missing body is indicative of the fact that the God has been raised in some form and highly exalted. I mean, this was, this was, there are new, see uh, Richard Miller's resurrection and reception in early Christianity to see just how many accounts there are of this kind of thing. It was extremely prominent in the time that Christianity was emerging. And on top of that, as Robin Walsh and others have pointed out, the gospels are written by authors who are educated in Greek rhetoric and prose. They're sometimes mimicking these works. So they know these stories. Seems pretty obvious. They're just emulating what's, you know, what's out there. And making um, it better. There, there's no reason to think that the empty tomb is anything other than a fictional narrative that's right in the vein of other popular motifs of the time. They're just making it better as well. Yeah. That's another yeah. thing that Dennis always harps on. Hold on. Hey, bro, we're live. 536 people watching. What's up, man? Oh, shit, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm on with Derek Bennett. We're go we're live right now. Uh, I I'm going to have to call you back. Okay. I, I figure I'd, I'd put him on the spot. That was Neil from Gnostic Informant for everybody who's wondering. Oh, I hate that guy. <laughs> know it all ugh, ugh. thank you Love for the you super know. chat avros i i really appreciate it in first corinthians 15 paul believed in earthly bodily resurrection as he analogizes jesus to a seed buried so what about the seed case 
Paul believed that Jesus' body remained in the grave, tomb, but the spirit or plant emerged, raised. Thank you for that big super chat. Derek? Well, the whole point of, you know, drawing a comparison to the seed that is planted, which is the body that is buried, versus the body that is raised is to say that it's a whole new body. This doesn't have anything to do with an empty tomb. And I think you're probably trying to read that into it. Um, the whole point there is to say that this body is entirely different from the one that is buried. Um, and you see these kinds of, this kind of... Um, I think Avaros agrees the body goes down and only the spirit is raised. Because look, Paul believed that Jesus' body oh. remained in the grave tomb, but the spirit or plant, if you will, emerged. I see raised. What he's saying. This this depends on whether you think that Jesus that that Jesus's uh, spiritual body split off from his mortal body, in other words, separation, or whether you think it's transformation. And I think Paul makes it clear that what he means is transformation. We will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We will be transformed. That's what the mystery religions were selling too. So I think transformation is what's taking place here. Jesus' dead body was transformed into this new spiritual divine body. Um, but again, Paul doesn't have, Paul doesn't tell us he's placed in a tomb. And this is uh, why maybe... Buried this is why you have a missing body story concocted, right? That may well be. That's a really good point. It could be that, that Mark, the first evangelist is uh, basically extending that idea, that narrative. He could even be thinking of uh, Isaiah 53, nine to supply this with the idea of a rich man uh, having buried him, as it says in Isaiah 53, mm. nine. Um, yeah, that, that may well be. Thank you. Yeah, I did a few episodes with Steve Mason, for those of you who uh, want to check that out, and uh, James Tabor, where he talks about the spiritual resurrection, or at least this uh, transformation. Avaros, thank you again. He says, sorry, sorry, Paul did not believe in earthly bodily resurrection. So you were talking about transformation. So you think there's kind of this position prior to what we find in Luke and, and John that fits more along with when we talk about Heraclius or Hercules uh, dying on the pyre and they can't find his body, but he's transformed to a, a sort of a celestial body that can actually still produce offspring. And he's, he's right. deified of course. Right. Um, something like that. Yeah. And, and he's right here. Sorry. Paul did not believe in earthly bodily resurrection. No. Uh, Paul has him. The, the resurrection is more or less, uh, simultaneous with the exaltation. Um, that's not to say that exaltation and resurrection are synonymous concepts. He is made alive again, and he is exalted to the right hand of God. So he's not hanging out on earth. Mm. Um, that that's kind of what we're that's what we're talking about in First Thessalonians four. The whole idea is we who are alive, well, first, those who are dead will be raised. Um, they, they'll be raised first. And then those of us who are still alive will be taken up to meet them in the air. That implies that those who were first raised go up into the air to be with Jesus. And then we follow those who are still alive to meet him in the air. None of us are hanging out on earth. <laughs> even the dead that already died in yeah. christ are already in heaven technically yeah. is the idea yeah. okay yeah. or up in the air the, the yeah. terms that's air. not of course the jewish idea of a a um a new millennial kingdom on earth it is something different mm -hmm. and uh apologists will try to harmonize that but you know <laughs> it's, it's yeah. just harmonization Thank you so much. See truth. My buddy, Steven Sorensen, he has a question. He says, Derek Bennett, how do you determine how probable events are? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, as, as far as the priors go, the principle of analogy is a great way to go. A good example of this, Robert and Price talks about you get home from work, right? You're tired. You plop down on the couch and you pop on the TV 
and you don't remember which channel you left it on, but you turn on the TV and the first thing you see is a giant lizard destroying a major urban area. Now is your first thought, oh my God, I left the channel on CNN and this is taking place right now. This is terrifying. Or is it, okay, this is probably the sci-fi channel because I've seen this kind of thing in other Soho flicks before. This is probably Gojira tearing up Tokyo. You know, that's the principle of analogy. And it, historians use that tool to more or less assess how probable um, a, an ancient claim is from the outset. I agree with the apologists and with William Lane Craig that no matter how preposterous something may seem, you still have to be fair and look at the evidence. Because, hey, if the evidence is just so startlingly good that no matter how improbable, it's, it's just like, um, what was his name who wrote the, um, on miracles, David Hume? Yeah. Yeah, David Hume. You know, I mean, if it were more of a stretch to provide a naturalistic explanation than it were to simply just, you know, acknowledge the miracle, then you almost kind of have to go with the miracle, right? Or I don't, well, or at least I don't know. Yeah. Or at least I don't know. Right. Otherwise you're just, a, just a God of the gaps. But the, the simple fact of the matter is that the resurrection is wildly improbable on, uh, you know, given the priors as far as that goes. And the evidence does not raise its likelihood, the arguments from apologists, because they're, they're just not convincing at all. <laughs> it, it just doesn't get us. It, do, it doesn't do the trick. It's not getting us where they need them, you know, where they needed to be. So... Yeah. yeah, highly improbable. And again, I stress highly improbable that a fictional deity raised a man from the dead. Yeah. And in this next one, Avros, thank you for the super chat. Yahweh is myth, but the necessary maximally great being could have resurrected Jesus spiritually. This is an ontological argument, no dependent Yahweh. Yeah, except that those ideas still are coming from... Um, <laughs> ancient greeks who are cognitively um expressing this kind of stuff and those ideas are being grafted onto the biblical god i mean we can literally trace his evolution you know just as uh francesca stavrica polo uh just as she described i mean i'm sorry but this deity began as a myth and then these later greek ideas are grafted onto it. Um, there's no getting around that. Thank you so much. Um, Masi, uh, Muslim, I apologize if I butchered your name. Jesus' teachings of sharing and caring lives on and has been instrumental in uplifting humanity, but ungrateful individuals want death of Jesus teachings. No, no we don't. <laughs> I mean, look, um, I like to idealize Jesus myself, even as an atheist who argues that he's dead, <laughs> you know, and, and I fully recognize, I think it's Albert Schweitzer who said that people tend to uh, try and demonstrate who Jesus was or what he was like. And in so doing, they're just looking in the mirror at their own reflection. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're uh, constructing a, a, a Jesus that, that best fits their needs and desires. You know what? Uh, guilty is charged. I, you know, I mean, why not? He is so iconic that, uh, you know, I, I almost, I enjoy doing that. I like looking at, you I mean, you, you, you can't say that Jesus was a liberal or a conservative, a Republican or a Democrat, because those kinds of political uh, institutions did not exist in first century Judea. But you can look at certain things he is said to have said that are very much in the spirit of some popular um, liberal sentiments, which I share. And so, you know, Jesus is caring for the poor, um, his recognizing 
greed and, and wealth and power as being destructive. I love that message. So, uh, you know, I, I don't feel it necessary to wash away anything that Jesus uh, taught or at least, you know, is thought to have taught. I appreciate that message still today, even as an atheist who doesn't believe in the deity of Christ. I I I think that the same would be said of the super chatter. And thank you for the super chat mm -hmm. that um, if they are Muslim and I think they probably are, they have a Muslim Jesus. And so everybody has their own Jesus and pointing out what we're doing today is more of a historical. We're taking a historical approach. So, you know, the legend about Jesus is a different thing than trying to exhume the corpse, so to speak. Uh, you might I'm one day you're going to be gone, Derek. Hopefully you leave a legend. You know what I mean? Let's rock on, man, and make it happen. But you'll leave a legend, uh, hopefully, and people will remember you for that. Uh, but if people started making claims, <laughs> Derek's alive forever and he's saving you or he's going to cook you forever in hell or something. And that's the Christian idea, of course, that God is going to punish you forever. Yeah, I think it's just uh, it's it's a good thing to say, all right, you take this serious. So let's take this serious and see where it leads. Anyway, vaguely agnostic. Thank you for the six, six, six. Paul wasn't at the meeting where they decided the tomb was empty. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think he got that memo. Nope. Thank you so much for that, man. I appreciate the support. Avros back again. Yes, I believe that Jesus' body remained in tomb. Only spirit rose, according to Paul. Transformation is only for those alive at Parousia, like Paul. Yeah, I mean, you also have to take into account what he says in, I think, 2 Corinthians 5, which is that... Uh, he's discussing the resurrection body there as well. And he, he explicitly says that we don't want to be found naked, that we are to have a new heavenly dwelling by, by naked. He means a, just a naked platonic soul. So he's not talking about a pure spirit, but again, neither were uh, many of the commoners as related by various Greek authors um, concerning, you know, like I said, Romulus, Asclepius, Heracles, um, they had new divine bodies. And I think that's what Paul meant rather than just a purely naked soul or spirit. Thank you. Thank you. I think you agree. The body was still left in the tomb. Flip Flopsky. Yeah. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. We have evidence of a story about a man, not a man. Jesus never existed. I forgive you for being wrong. <laughs> the Jesus painted in the gospels. Yes. Never existed. The, 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 the Jesus that Paul is imagining is it existed in his imagination. Yes. Well, but where we would disagree is, yeah. is flip flopsky. You may one day flip flop just like I did. Maybe, maybe we're right. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. Appreciate the support. Of course, always being in the chat and uh, having different of, of opinions. So DJ Frank said, and thank you. Is it described how body was removed from cross? Was it laid flat or left upright? How are huge nails removed without damaging bones underneath? Hmm. It's a good question. I, I can't claim to know. Um, interestingly enough, I mean, they have found remains of people who were crucified. I think in the one case, the nail was bent to where they weren't able to actually extract it as they usually did. So sometimes that happened, but yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on that topic. Yeah. 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 But it is interesting to think, oh, I yeah. think it, it just thinking what DJ said is, are we, you know, it says not a bone on his body was broken. What were they using to extract this out of the body? Was it just a simple, easy tug? I mean, it's in wood, supposedly, whether it be tree or whether it be at a stake. I know, I, look, I, I was an arborist for many years. I cut trees down. I know how wood works. I can't imagine a massive nail being stuck in something like that. And you're not taking a heavy hammer or something to try and pry it, leaning against his bones, crushing. I can't imagine a bone wouldn't have broke. It's, it's fiction. It's narrative. So really interesting question. Stacy B, thank you for the super sticker. I appreciate the support and uh, make sure I didn't miss anything uh, by you. Um, everybody, man, I love you guys. I really do. Everybody in the chat is just 
showing love and, you know, saying thank you and stuff. Um, you know, she's just responding and saying thank you. So anyway, I love seeing that kind of stuff, like just people showing support and then they get love for showing support from people who are fans of what we do. Starlet, thank you for the super chat. I don't understand how people can even believe the New Testament is real. I love the names missing from his genealogies. Did you want to comment on it? I don't necessarily have a comment, but thank, thank you for the comment. Yeah, I, I know. I I get why you say you don't understand if you've never believed. I know and understand why. I know what it's like to, to be um, really infatuated with this experience attached to a narrative because, man, the story is powerful, especially when you yourself imagine that this being is thinking about you and you are special and you're going through a tough time in life because your alcoholic father is struggling with addiction and is verbally abusive to your mother endlessly throughout your life. And you're having to escape the house with gunshots being shot off. I'm telling you from personal experience and you want a father who's not an alcoholic. You want a father who's good to you and will never let you down. And you hear about this father that cared about you so much that he sent his only begotten son. Here I am about to preach the gospel. You see what I'm saying? I bought that as a child. My mother was a Christian. My father was a Christian. I know exactly what it's like to be in there. And then what it's like to gradually have that die or transform, if I could use the term, into something different. And, and empathize at the same time, educate and try to elucidate so people understand, look, that stuff has power in your mind. And, it, and and this is what we're seeing, but it's not necessary. You don't need that in order to live life. They think that that's what you need. And then afterlife, God, we haven't even began on hell. Uh, Averos, <laughs> thank you so much for the next super chat. I like Schweitzer, but love Schillemakers or Schillemakers, Christian faith and on religion speeches to its cultural despisers, very different Christianity. Wow. Interesting. I'm not familiar with that, but that sounds, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. I need to, I need to check these out. Both of the, well, your whole presentation, all the sources, Jerry Pena, uh, they ask a good question. Can we get a cop? Don't you have this on Patreon? Um, this, I don't, I don't know how to share the slideshows on Patreon or else I would, um, what I would recommend doing, I was just about to say this is that if you're watching this, if you watch this again, be sure to pause the screen on those slides where I provide references and, and, and dig into this stuff yourself. There's only so much I can include in one slideshow with 36 slides. There's a lot of, I, I was careful to provide a lot of great references for you guys. So pause the screen, uh, get a good look at, at who or what I'm referencing and check it out for yourself. You will find a, a wealth of, of really great, fascinating, um, informative stuff. Yeah, there's always something good in your, um... I loved your resurrection, the idiom, uh, the evolution of resurrection as an idiom and whatnot. That presentation was just fantastic, giving us a better understanding that this wasn't a new idea. Um, and, and it just took on different various meanings historically over time that mm -hmm. I've changed. Yep. Uh, thank you for that super, super chat, JM. I really appreciate it. Uh, and we have caught up on all of the super chats. Derek, would you like to... Tell us again, what is, uh, let's see, that's you. Sorry, wrong one. Let me do this. This here, uh, people could sign up on the courses. Yes, the Global Center for Religious Research uh, is going to be doing online courses for which you can get a certification starting next month here in March. Um, Raphael Ataster will be teaching a philosophy of religion course concerning arguments for and against the existence of God, and he'll let you make up your own mind in the end. Uh, Aaron Ricker <laughs> will be teaching a course on the Bible and culture, and this will relate as well to culture in the modern day, how the Bible has influenced uh, modern art, film, television, you name it. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Darren Slade, 
the president of GCRR will be teaching a course on uh, religious trauma. These courses are only $140. That's comparatively very little compared to uh, what you would pay at a university. So it's a great deal. You get a certification for it. Uh, I encourage everyone to check it out. Sign mm -hmm. up. Absolutely. That is also in the description. I wanted to give that plug for Derek. Uh, he's, he's did an excellent presentation today. If you are tuning in now, you are late to the party. It's okay. Don't worry. You can play this back. And trust me, you want to. You want to share this. You want to get this out there. Let the apologists know. You know, let them um, let them give their thoughts to you. Of course, there's always going to be a response. I asked this of Bart Ehrman before. I said, Bart, you know, what about this contradiction? I interviewed him and we went through like in the Greek into these problems and contradictions. And finally, like towards the end, he starts chuckling. And he's like, Derek, if you try hard enough, you can make anything work, especially oh, yeah. when you want your belief to be true. You can make anything work. And that's exactly what we see happening. So um, another super chat, Zachary Sorensen. Thank you for that super chat, my friend. Eleazar and Martha, both us, seem to be Lazarus and Martha of Bethany. Lazarus and Eleazar are both victims of Annas. Why don't historicists ever talk about this? Does Acts dominate too much? Hmm. This is a question I need to ask. I've never sat here and thought about this in particular. Yeah. Yeah, good question for Bart. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear what mm -hmm. Bart has to say. And now that I'm actually in contact with him a lot more, uh, well, him, I could ask any of the other uh, academics as well, but that would be a good question. I'd like to see what he'd mm -hmm. say, you know, because you're going to get an answer from mythicists and we already know what right. they say. I've, I've right. endlessly interviewed mythicists on my channel. Like we all know what mythicists say about these things. Oh yeah, that might be a fictional thing or this, this, that. But uh, to hear a historicist answer, it'd be really interesting to hear what they say. So I wanted to jump back and grab that super chat because uh, I didn't want you to feel like I left you hanging there, my friend. Um, let me plug your YouTube. I love showing love to my guest. For those who don't know, I'm going to go ahead and post the YouTube link. It is in the description. But if you're like, uh, I just want to see it in the chat and I want to click it and subscribe. There it is. Be sure to go subscribe. Uh, one of my favorites, I think, is the origins of Yahweh. I, I can't get over that uh, opening there. In fact, can I play the beginning again? Go right ahead. I mean, it ties into what I was talking about today some. So, yeah. Yeah, this is this is going to make you want to watch his, his YouTube, too. So this is my little advertisement for you, my friend. Here we go. You might have seen videos like this before. But here's the big secret. Anyone... Oh, hello, hello everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, there we go. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Yahweh began to exist. Therefore, Yahweh has a cause. I love that intro, Hello. dude. That that just that intro grabs me every single freaking time. I, I wish I could meet this guy that that produced that video. <laughs> it would be amazing if I could. Uh, <laughs> He's a good kid. Good kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, real quick, I don't even. I don't want to butcher your name, but is it Zupatar? Zupiter? I, I forgive me. Excellent presentation. By the way, if Jesus is the bright morning star as per Revelation, maybe he is Satan. Mm. Lucifer, a light bearer. Ooh. 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 <laughs> Thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Yeah, look at the love. Seriously. Uh, Melody's always in the chat looking out. There's that guy you said you didn't like. <laughs> Nils the man. Hey, Nils, another man. Nils kicking butt. He helped me edit a uh, couple of videos that I just put on Patreon. Go subscribe to Neil as well. Uh, if you want true gnosis, if you don't want true gnosis, then just yeah, if you don't want it, it, then don't do it. But yeah, if you don't want do it, it. Definitely you do want, it. If you want it, then do it. Yep. Uh, one more share here. Everybody who's in the chat, I appreciate you for sticking around and dealing with us here. We're having fun. Uh, this is the Patreon. This Patreon will give you direct access to God. Um, you will have endless uh, massage therapy sessions with happy endings. 
And um, what else could I possibly come? I know Ravi Zacharias. He was a Patreon of mine. Um, <laughs> who else? Anyway, there's a lot of scholars, academics. Please consider uh, going and help supporting the work. Of course, I use the funds to help keep doing what we're doing here at Mythvision. But um, join the Patreon. You only If you want to start and you're just like, I don't have a lot of money. I, I get it. And you're not able to support a lot. I get it. It's only $3 a month. That gets you in the door. That keeps the flames from hurting you. You'll feel like you're taking a warm bath in milk. And uh, you don't have to worry about anything. You'll have wings. All of that stuff will come to you. And, of course, these are the latest at the top. But um, please consider doing that. And the Genesis course. I said this earlier. I edited the, the finalized form of this. So I had to listen to these six lectures by Bart Ehrman. And I was so impressed that he knew what he knew about Genesis and, of course, the Pentateuch. He gets into the hypothesis, the documentary hypothesis. He gets into so much stuff in this. I was just blown away. I said, man, I didn't know he knew that much about the Hebrew Bible, but come to find out, he taught and lectured. And Hebrew. he actually had courses where he taught at Chapel Hill the Hebrew Bible and stuff. He read the whole Hebrew Bible in Hebrew. So I was really impressed with his knowledge of this and, of course, going from legend, history, and myth defining what each means when this happens that is on this let me let me put it in the link down in the description it is early bird special i think it's still going on and uh just posting that down in the chat for everybody last but not least i mean if you want me to go sit in pontius pilate's seat uh there's we're going to be seeing a lot of the sites that uh are where jesus would have walked if we grant that that is where he was he was located. Uh, Pontius Pilate's actual seat, archaeologically, where he was. Mm. If you want to help fund us going to Israel, I will be there with James Tabor and Gnostic Informant, my buddy Nil. We're going to record our asses off. I plan on taking a special trip down through the tunnel that was, uh, was it, Who's who dug that tunnel? Is Josiah? It, uh, just, I thought it was Nehemiah or something. I don't know. There's a tunnel down in the earth that was dug by the Israelites that they kept water or they, they were getting water during uh, sieges. So they were I stuck. think it was Josiah. I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure it was Josiah. I plan on going all over the place. And our favorite, Francesca Stavrakopoulou, said that uh, her favorite apocalyptic prophet in the first century was a guy named Hanny. And he was a circle drawer. So I told Dr. Tabor, I said, I got to go to his grave. Just, I got to go film where this guy's grave is, the circle drawer apocalyptic figure. How amazing would it be if I came back in all of these locations? Because we're going to be able to get behind the scenes. He's, he's an archaeologist, so he'll have access to things that your normal people aren't going to have. And me and Neil are going to be the recorders filming the, the whole thing. And, and, and I hope to make that happen. So, the 430 people here watching, please like this video. Please share this video. And uh, last super chat, Avaros, excellent interview. D, excellent presentation. Derek Bennett, thank you for your support. Derek, final words to everybody in the audience, if you don't mind. Final words? Well, you know... Um... I didn't get much sleep because I was so excited <laughs> and nervous about this presentation. So I hope I performed well in terms of presenting. Um, I would just end on, you know, again, I, I just would emphasize that, you know, I'm not trying to strip anyone of their beliefs. If you're a Christian and you cherish your belief that uh, Jesus was raised from the dead, have at it. <laughs> I'm not trying to dissuade anyone i i don't care what anyone else believes and, and it certainly doesn't bar against my uh having a friendship with them or loving them to death um i'm only defending non-belief here and i am making the case that you're not going to convince us with these apologetics they are they're they're pretty stale and trite they've been rehashed and warmed over a hundred different different times in a hundred different ways and they're they're just not they are not convincing um and at the end of the day fictional deities don't raise men from the dead wow. <laughs> but you know you're welcome to believe it it's just 
not true. <laughs> I don't know a nicer way to say that. <laughs> yeah, you really have. I want the audience to know, like for the past few days, you've been saying this is going to be very blunt and I'm a likable, nice guy. I don't really want to be rude, but I, I'm going to have to say things yeah. in this episode that are just going to be what I think. And that's okay. Cause they say what they think and they defend right. what they believe. So, right. so we need to be able to say what, what you're actually thinking. Now I do yeah. it all the time, but I say it cause Go ahead. And I'm aware that if any Christians uh, have watched this or will be watching this, they're going to have probably myriad uh, responses uh, to what I presented here. Um, I seriously doubt that any of them are going to be very compelling. But have at it. <laughs> and another thing, I might as well say this out loud because this might stir some controversy out there to get you attention among the apologists. Derek's like me. Uh, we both have a background in addiction. He wrote a book, Addicticus. Is it Addicticus? Addictus. Addictus. Sorry. Um, you know, why, as a person who's in recovery or a person who no longer does drugs without God, interesting book. I say that to say one of the things that contributed to using drugs and alcohol for us is escaping ourselves, the way that we are, we, we treat ourselves. And, and we don't like to have that ego there where, uh, I'm right, you're wrong, and it's a battle of tribes, etc. We don't like that, which is why at the end of the day, you might have some like well-known, popular atheists who just don't care what they do. They bring a bull into a china shop, and they're not trying to empathize. They're just like, it's stupid. You're idiotic. You're hallucinating. You're, you know, uh, Richard Dawkins, for example, people like that. And um, while we might think at times that way, we personally aren't trying to go out here and be those debaters and it's not because we couldn't possibly do a damn good job debating or challenging it's kind of a self thing and it's to make sure that we keep control of ourselves so that we don't go too far i think you're on the same page with me on that absolutely 100 percent. yep yep apologia says what way can we imagine that derek and derek are alike i don't know may i count the ways <laughs> I mean, I'll say that his spelling of his name is correct, you know. Yeah, um, mine's right. Mine is wrong. Incorrect. That's false. Yeah, yeah. Can I just say that I'm absolutely tickled pink to have Paula Gia watching this? That's fantastic. Love, love that you're love that you're here. Thank you, Paula Gia. Yeah, yeah. I actually told um me and Paula Gia have been talking telepathically actually during this entire episode. He'll do that. Um yeah, he has capabilities. Be <laughs> He's hiding them from everybody. You, you got to be part of the inner circle. But um, I think he might be. He told me he's considering actually having you on his show oh. at some point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just. Are we. Am I mistaken? All right. We'll talk about it after. All right. So just making sure, you know, I, I'm i teasing everybody uh, with this so they understand uh, we have powers, but we can prove our powers. <laughs> and we have eyewitnesses. And they're you. And never forget. We are myth vision